Welcome to everybody to our workshop on society, how to live in harmony with biodiversity. And I would like to introduce the first speaker um, of today. The first speaker of today is uh, Berta Martinez Lopez from the uh, Leuphana University of uh, Germany. She's a professor uh, for international uh, sustainable development and planning. And her presentation today will be rena uh, relational paradigms in social ecological research, contributions for living in harmony with nature. Um, Mrs. M um, Martina Lopez, um, uh, her research is focusing on essentially three principles. First, how can be cooperative and cooperative interdisciplinary research um, developed with the goal to uh, relate values, knowledge and institutions um, to actually um, achieve transformational change. I hope I have somehow summarized this <laughs> properly, <laughs> properly. And I think one of the second goals is um, impact-oriented transdisciplinary research um, to understand our influence of the academic world into our outside world, which is also an extremely interesting topic because many scientists are actually not caring about this. <laughs> and therefore, I'm really fascinated by this. And of course, uh, the third one is reciprocity and reflexivity. What does it mean if we do research? How much can the question of relevance on our research actually influence our own way of considering research science and the effects of this? I hope I have somehow uh, um, summarized your efforts and now the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you for coming. You, you did it wonderfully. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, share the screen. Um, yes, this one, and now. Perfect. So, um, actually, today, um, instead of thinking how people can be involved to move towards uh, living in harmony with nature, my idea is to present how people and researchers can nurture uh, paradigms of uh, living in harmony with nature. We all know that now we are... Um, in the middle of the conference of the parties for wetlands, for climate change. In one month, we have the conference of the parties for biodiversity. And in words of Christiana Figueres, who was the former executive secretary of the framework of convention on climate change, when culminated with the Paris Agreement, she just said last week that with these COPs, we are facing the choice of which door to open which door to cross. And if we continue to understand our relation with nature in a way that we can endlessly extract resources with few or non responsibilities towards nature and towards other people, and if we continue to compete with each other for these resources, we intentionally, uh, we will chose the first door, and then by the end of this decade, we will be on the way to a world of uh, accelerating destruction and further injustice. If we choose that door, the role of researchers would be mere spectators and then reporting the destruction, accountants for destruction. However, if we choose the second door, and again in terms of Christiana Figueres' words, uh, we need to go beyond recognizing um, complex interactions between people and nature. We have to include all the worldviews that entail reciprocity and relationality with nature. It means that we must choose radical collaboration and we have to nurture an ethos of care. And this is a society, but also as researchers. Um, if we choose that door, uh, these are not words of uh, Christina uh, Figueres, but are my own words, then it means that we are working with relational paradigms. Inspired by a group of um, young researchers, brilliant young researchers, who made the plea very recently for a relational turn for sustainability science, they um, compare 
three modes of science. Mechanistic, which is like uh, what um, usually happens with uh, pure disciplines where researchers are observers of uh, reality. Uh, the second is complex systems paradigms, and the third is relational. I will compare here only complex systems uh, paradigms with relational. Uh, complex systems is the traditional way by which we understand social ecological systems. And ontologically, in this approach, we consider entities that are distant, but we are very much aware of the interactions. For example, we consider society, we consider ecosystems, and how they interact with each other. The entry point would be, therefore, these interactions and the distant entities. And the framework is people and nature connected in different ways. However, if we move towards relational paradigms, we consider that the world exists in a perpetual state of becoming and that processes can be unfold and researchers can be the leverage to unfold process for transformation. The entry point are there for these relations and processes and the framework is people are nature. Not people and nature, but people are nature. And we consider that this process happened through experience, embodied experience. And as there are many different modes of experience in nature, Therefore, it's a call for inclusivity to include all the worldviews by which people are nature. Now we are somehow uh, doing this transition or considering both. If we look at the IPBS conceptual framework, it's actually a description of social ecological systems where nature interact with uh, people through in this case, nature contributions to people. The perspective of complex systems allows us to generalize, to do uh, global assessments through categories of nature contributions to people. But the framework also moved, and this for me was a huge step towards the context-specific perspective, which is relational paradigms. All the different ways by which people understand that they are nature, that we are nature. And these are the Amazonian cosmovisions by which a person can become an animal or uh, an animal it's in a family, it's a, in a kinship relation with uh, the community, with a family, it's a, there are family ties, or the Aboriginal people in, in Australia by which they know how to protect the uh, environment for the bees through the dreams with the bandillas, which are these um, uh, people surrounding the bees. And they are very much connected with the bees. And through the dreams, they know when to collect the honey uh, and what actions to do in the, in the countryside. Um, one might think that, uh, Relational paradigms apply to place-based research or local um, scales, while more analysis of complex systems applies to global and regional levels. But last year, um, they present how these two generalizing and context-specific, we have already examples, despite it's really new, already examples that happen from global to regional to local. So it can be applied at different scales. The second aspect that um, um, was looked at in this paper of relational paradigms is the role of concepts. In complex systems, we understand that concepts and frameworks reflect the current world. However, the relational paradigm we believe that language and concepts actually shape our world. And therefore, this is why concepts need to be interrogated and rebuilt. Uh, bringing the relational thinking to sustainability science, different frameworks and different concepts 
came as new. One of those was the recent concept of relational values, which is the one I'm going to look at right now. Um, so far until 2007, when we, uh, sorry, 16, when we, co we coined the idea of relational values, um, the framework for conserving nature was either based on instrumental values, meaning that nature give us benefits, so we look at the utility of nature, or intrinsic values, that nature has the right to exist. But in, in 2016, we coined the idea of relational values because we witnessed many other ways why, by which people care about nature. And these are relationships, to have meaningful relationships and desirable relationships between people and nature and between people and among people mediated by nature. These go from cultural identity, social cohesion, social responsibility for future generations, and individual relational values between one person and nature can be uh, the aesthetic enjoyment of a place or the stewardship. Until very recently, until this was coined, all the research was instrumental versus intrinsic. And suddenly when this was coined and we start to empirically research whether relational values matter, what we found, no matter where and when, that relational values are always resonating broadly and differently, no matter whether urban or rural context, and no matter which year. These are different examples in Colombia, uh, with indigenous communities and farmers, and, the, and this is another example, very, very recent empirical research here in Bavaria. But not only that, what we found is that framing biodiversity conservation in relational terms with relational values might engage more people and enable communities, society to rethink conservation in the context of local narratives and the sense of place, the relation with nature, and what it means to pursue a good life and meaningful relationships with nature. And indeed, an empirical research of uh, this year, we show that in those settings where relational values appear, which is bottom-up conservation. Uh, this is in the Cape Floristic region, Rhinosterfeld area. Those farmers who have this bottom-up conservation of the Rhinosterfeld area that rely on relational values, these settings are the ones that provide a highly diverse set of nature contributions to people. So it relates with multifunctionality. It relates with the possibility of enjoy several uh, nature contributions to people, while those settings that only relay, um, only rely on instrumental values, the set of nature contributions to people gets narrower and narrower. And these are also the findings of the last IPV's report on diverse values, where it shows that relational values appear across different worldviews from anthropocentric to biocentric to uh, what we call pluricentric, but precisely the stewardship and responsibility and the worldview on living, um, about living in harmony with nature, it's happening because relational values and intrinsic values. And the last bit is Okay, what is then the role of researchers to understand uh, how we approach living in, in harmony with nature? And here there are, again, the two paradigms. If we go for complex systems, then we believe that we have to observe the phenomena, we we'll report about the phenomena, but we, we strive to maintain objectivity. However, relational paradigms, we know because we are part of the observed phenomena, and therefore what we do is to strive to clarify positionality, where I position myself. And 
to show this with the idea of relational values, we um, explore in 10 different uh, case studies of the Global South how plural valuation can support living in harmony with nature, looking at improving quality of life of marginalized people, looking at improving the distribution of nature contributions to people among people, and improving the sustainable flow of nature contributions to people. And what we found is that there is a set of uh, practices by researchers that by doing plural valuation of nature, we can foster these outcomes. While some case studies try estimate, elicit plural values, including relational values, and look at the trade-offs between values and among stakeholders and between nature contributions to people. The only case studies that manage these sustainable and just outcomes were those that were action-oriented, were those that include co-production of knowledge, and were those that different worldviews were reconciled and negotiated in, in the process of research. This also relates with the idea that researchers, we have the role to transform institutions actively and constructively. And this means to create a spaces for nurture values, particularly relational values that underpin living in harmony with nature, integrate marginalized communities and their knowledge and capacities, develop methods to allow these marginalized groups to speak in their own voice and reflect about our power as researcher and contest also power imbalance. These principles are actually the principles of an ethos of care. So to sum up, uh, what I try to convey in these 15 minutes is that relational approach offer platforms to nurture human nature connectedness co that contribute to living in harmony with nature and that approaches that foster relational values, including research approaches that include uh, or elicit relational values, can support living in harmony with nature by resituating people as active stewards of nature and these approaches need necessarily to rely on a caring ethos for knowledge production. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Berta, for your presentation. Very, very intriguing. I'm just checking whether we have one short question before we continue to the next presentation and then we reserve the, the other questions to the panel discussion at the end. Uh, we do have one quick question. Can you see the chat better? Can you read it by yourself or should I repeat it? Oh, where is it? How okay. you, I think the chat, yes. is on, the chat is on your right side. And uh, there's a question from Sonia Daum and it says, do relational values include relationships in non-human nature or just between humans and nature? Um, this is a very good question. Uh, the original idea of relational values is that the idea that values are expressed and hold by people. And this is why the original idea is uh, the meaningful relationships between people mediated by nature and uh, between people and nature. However, if we move to the relational paradigm, uh, which goes beyond relational values, the relationships of non-human nature are included. But when we elicit the importance of nature as it's uh, driven by people, this is why it's between humans and nature and between humans mediated by nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So, Beata, um, uh in the final round of the panel discussion, please stay and then we, we, we meet again. No? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're coming to the next presentation. The next presentation will be given by um, Diana Magalagiu. She's from the University of Oxford and hi, <laughs> an uh, honorary research associate of the University of Oxford. Um, her presentation will be on the role of narratives in reframing human nature relations and cultural transformations. Diana is a professor at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at the University of Oxford. 
and also at Science Po and RMS in France. And Dan has a dual background in both natural sciences and social sciences. Very, very interesting. Um, previous positions included um, uh, being a reader at the HEC School of Management in Paris, scientific director of the Center for Central and Eastern European Studies, senior scientist at the Complex Systems Lagrange Lab uh, Institute for Scientific Interchange in Italy. And from 2001 to 2003, she has spent two years traveling, leading, participating in research and development projects in Latin America, Africa, and South and in the South Pacific. Um, your research has, as far as I know, focused in the past decade on sustainability and social responsibility in corporate and public policy settings um, addressed uh, through the articulation of modeling, social experimentation, foresight, and so forth. And you are also um, the co-founder of the Initiative for Science, Society and Policy, Policy Dialogue. And you're also a leading author of the Global Environmental Outlook of the United Nations Environmental Program. Um, Diana, thank you very much for um, accepting the invitation to present here. And the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much for this um, introduction. Um, so indeed, um, well, just to add to what was just said, um, I've got from all this point of view, and indeed I'm a kind of hybrid, I increasingly started working um, with IPBES and the International Science Council also on the questions of biodiversity um, related questions. And this, the question of cultural transformation, of reframing, framing, and particularly the role of narrative, it's something which has been in my work quite important in the last, well, I would say something like two decades. So what I'm gonna do here today, I'm gonna try to have a kind of um, high level view on narratives. And then in the discussion piece, or even towards this, the end of this speech, um, I can uh, go into more to put some flesh on the bones and talk about some of the um, concrete examples of what we, how we do uh, and how we play and how we work with narratives in, in various projects and uh, communities. So I would start, you know, with maybe basic, but first, what are narratives are, you know? because we talk and we hear more and more, a lot of discussions about narratives, narratives in the COP27, which is now in Sharm el uh, COPs in the uh, narratives in our political discourses, uh, how um, narratives are instrumentalized, for example, in what's going on in the, in the conflict created by the Russian invasion in Ukraine. You have the same things in the midterm elections in US and so on. But just to very basically, narratives are stories, but they are socially constructed. And individuals and collectives try to make sense of events and phenomena. They bring them home to to put themselves at work in their own worldviews, and they shape our preferences, our opinions, our attitudes, and our behaviors at individual and collective level. So basically, they, they are created to react sometimes to particular events or trends in the worldviews of the society when we experience them you know you could see i'm sure all of you experience how particular events as the covid 19 pandemic started creating and or being shaped and being brought in already existing narratives however you have these competitions and ecosystems of narratives and you have multi-dimensional configurations and a different level we have to understand how these systems and ecosystems of narrative work. And 
such narratives play a real fundamental role in grounding our values, but also our institutions. They uh, impact the way we act, uh, we decide, they can change, they can slow down change, they can accelerate change. And this is why actually the, in the work I have been doing in the arena of sustainability in the last two decades, I have been focusing more and more on the role of narratives. And also, of course, they in the death ecosystems, they narratives are articulated in networks. And the, when we talk about the kind of futures we imagine, and which can drive change in our societies, again, we could start with the narratives and the values which are underlying them. One important aspect is the fact that narratives are always contextual. It's a, there is always a cultural component to any narratives. Uh, similar ideas get expressed very differently in uh, um, different cultures, in the previous in a number of years, we worked on uh, what we call win-win narratives or climate action in a number of contexts. And, uh, and uh, it was really interesting to see that, uh, for example, we're working in urban spaces in big megalopolises in worldwide, Shanghai, um, Istanbul, Jakarta and others. And even the concept of win-win, but even the concept of how you change in between um, a status quo to something which can be reframed and shaped into a win-win had a very different a meaning in the different uh, context. And also you have the same narrative. Sometimes narratives don't travel very well. They get interpreted very differently in different cultures. And again, you know, we talk a lot about sustainability transition. In another project we are working today on in um, tipping points, socio-ecological tipping points in uh, carbon and high carbon regions in the world. We are deploying quite a lot of work with indigenous groups in uh, Mexico and also in the Arctic. And we can see that even the, the very concept of sustainability transition or, or uh, other concepts related don't really resonate in the way we 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 assume it with our um, westernized let's say view so depending on this context the narrative can either fix the assumptions attitude and opinion or also they can open it up for change um, well maybe let me take a example in our context european context you know where when you look at the future, uh, if you look at the 300 plus last years, well, Middle Ages, the future were more of the same. So the future was a past extrapolated to the present. And well, things have been always the way they were, but they are now. Later on, we had the Enlightenment, uh, Industrial Revolution, increasingly we use a fossil fuel energy, which with a lot of accelerated innovation. And basically from the past, we started thinking about the future. Change became a reality, good or bad, but mostly change was also, and future was seen as positive. You know, in Italy, we have this, um, um, newspaper called Domani, which is tomorrow. And it was by design and by its very nature, it was supposed to be positive. Now, as you all know, when you think about tomorrow, it's not necessarily we are looking at the, into a positive future. And also we started closer to the date and even more so in the last decades, thinking about the future as being shaped by us, you know, us humans, are shaping the future and the question of progress uh, came deep. Now the question is, okay, we have these narratives, they are contextual, but can they change and how they change? And I'm arguing that they are, not, they are essential to enable social real change. However, when different narratives in this ecosystem I was talking about are conflated, 
you don't necessarily get the same result you expected. Uh, so how you change this imagined future? It's gonna change the way you think about uh, attitudes, ideas, but also our institutions. Let me look now at maybe um, how thinking in terms of narratives uh, between the relation between humans and the environment, uh, just taking two different perspectives. Let's look at the relation between society and environment as a milieu. Well, basically we compare humanity with nature. Um, basically nature is out there, it's unknown, it's strange. Um, we as humans are mostly there to see what's happening and we are passive in an environment which is active, sometimes aggressive, sometimes not. But change is basically attributed to nature and we, uh, we adapt to the nature. And you can see the other way of uh, looking at the relationship in between society and environment. Uh, well, basically in that space, and nature and humanity are a kind of on a pair. And nature is not so, obviously it's, it's important, but we, we as humans, we are active, possibly aggressive in a natural environment and the nature becomes the passive. So we change the nature and we create our environment. And we, that's, that's very much reflected in many of the ways we relate in our language. So natural changes is more controllable and it's not dangerous. The dangerous uh, pieces in that relation could be us. So basically, if you look from the society's perspective or environmental perspective, you have a kind of in, in, uh, in interchange in between who is the referent and who is the subject. Uh, well, but when you have these two perspectives interacting, you can overestimate the danger of nature, you can underestimate the human interventions um, dangers, basically. Well, so we have to see where we are in that space. So if we are encouraged to intervene in the natural environment and we, con we are convinced that such intervention reduce the environmental risk, Great. However, and that's been a kind of mantra for quite a number of decades or hundreds of years even. But then we reduce the predictability of natural phenomena, as we know. And many dimensions in this natural processes are getting, getting changed, but we don't really get exactly what's going on in terms of perceptions. So then we continue to intervene, we change even more. We think sometimes we are a mitigated risk and sometimes we just add on the risk and we aggravate the, the same risks. So let me take an example on climate actions and then I'm gonna <clears throat> come back maybe towards the, the end of this uh, talk um, to um, the biodiversity and the discussions which are on the, <clears throat> on the COP, the biodiversity COP and others. In, on climate actions, the historical na na narrative massively uh, emphasized the top-down solutions. We need a global binding uh, um, international agreement in the way to reduce emissions. And all of that was climate change research, what I would call traditional view of the interface in between science and policy. So basically, we are climate scientists, we provide relevant information and accurate information to policymakers on all impacts of uh, greenhouse gases, impacts of what's going to happen on future generation, also the questions of who is responsible for the meeting, who is um, basically taking the most of the burden in terms of impact, and also the questions uh, and the argument for the ethical argument of uh, how to basically assist a number of countries in the, meeting the cost for mitigation and adaptation. Well, I would say that narrative was very successful 
in the first place, because at least it brought the climate issue on the political agenda. You know, the UNFCCC, the IPCC, the, the COPs. Uh, however, what we've seen in uh, COP15 in 20, 2009 in uh, Copenhagen, well, this didn't really work. I mean, we wanted much, but basically this reducing the emissions were really saying, well, how do we do the trade-off in between reducing emissions and, uh, and um, um, the economic cost which come with? And again, the question is the economic cost, um, is there an economic cost or there an economic benefit? That's also something which basically it's shaped by narratives. So all of that gives to a social dilemma or the narrative itself incentivizes free riding, basically. If it's a burden, well, how do I escape the burden? Or how to equally divide or proportionally divide the global emissions. And this, from these top-down narratives and schemes of how to achieve reduction in emission, we went in a number of phases to the Paris Agreement in 2015, where we combined in some ways these top-down narratives with a bottom-up narrative. We think, okay, let's go more towards voluntary contributions by the NDCs. We acknowledge definitely that there are trade-offs. So please, we encourage countries to voluntarily contribute. And we also say, well, there are a lot of interest, interest individually for countries and for their actors in order to do more climate action. That also changed to some extent the way we interacted in, in terms of science and policy. Well, I would want to say this is not necessarily a very new narrative because that kind of narrative is very much used in the context of communities, in cities, in regions, in community-based adaptation and other. And the ethical argument is there, and I'm sure as you are, as me, you are following the, what's going on or be really heavily involved in what's going on in Sharm el-Sheikh. And you can see that now the basically the only discussion which is there uh, on the agenda or the main one is about the financial transfer and the hundred billion um, uh, dollar spot, which doesn't get filled in up by the developed countries. Well, that kind of things you can see it, how the, the, the narratives also shape, you know, in all the controversies which you have in Europe about the migrants uh, coming into the into Europe. So just to Basically, the, the question is how in this schemes, discussions, narrative, how you, you shift the focus from studying in that respect um, the climate dynamics to studying and transforming the societal dy dynamic. And basically how to go and have something which I would call transformative narratives and new, new narratives which can be bottom-up, not necessarily fully bottom-up, but that's kind of sandwich, uh, intermediate levels and others. Can we have more positive and more engaging stories? Of course, we are not talking about utopian futures, but basically how do I articulate visions where, where we want to go, what kind of solutions we want, and instead of saying what we want to avoid as problems. So just to finish, I would say that the role of narrative and how you understand you can change the narrative and you and who and we, the agent is very important. Who is changing the narrative and for what? And um, all of the behaviors are rooted in narratives and the way we experience that. They are shaped, our society and our culture are shaped by this past dependence. Um, of widely anchored, multi-level and multi-dimensional narratives. And all we do, it's somehow embedded in that context. So basically changing the narratives would be, I think, the one of the major ways in which society can create more favorable circumstances towards sustainability. 
but also let them express different values, different views of the world, um, not only our Western centric ones. And how to make the to make sure that you have compatibilities, or at least these narratives are at least able to listen to each other, and how to manage to introduce novel narratives which resonate with existing ones, so that because if not, we just get resistance, but introduce novel and fundamental novel uh, values. And basically, instead of bringing new theories, I think this is much better and much easier to do in terms of very practical pro propositions than different mindsets, communities, worldviews can take apart, interpret different ways, depending on the frame of mind of the people involved and make it easier for change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiana. Uh, very interesting talk indeed. Um, I just was wondering how can we align the different narratives we have on a global scale through <laughs> and whether there is actually a consensus on some key parts of most of the social narratives. Um, I would like to, to uh, have one question here, um, uh, which is coming from Katharina Rosi Würz. What about changing narratives in the context of digital social media? Wow. Uh, very interesting question. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I actually come from, you know, I'm a kind of, I come from a geek background. You know, I did my PhD more than 20 years ago in artificial intelligence. So all these questions of what's happening in the digital space and um, it, it's something I'm very much at home on. Well, there are actually, I would say, a lot of bottles of, Ecosystem, in the ecosystems of narratives in the social media. I mean, digital social media are there. Uh, you can see the big players, the, the questions of ownership, the questions of um, pay or not pay. You know, when we talk about something you get free in the digital space, well, most of the time, if you don't pay for it, probably it's because if you don't pay for your lunch, it's because you are the lunch. So then the question is, who is invited at the table of, of, to, to eat in this lunch? But I mean, I, I, I would be very happy to have a conversation about that, but that, that's a huge topic. And I mean, it's a kind of really uh, hot topic right now, but definitely uh, right on spot. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Diana. Um, please stay also um, for the final discussion. Um, let, uh, we'll see how much time we will have. Um, I would like, thank you, huh? I would like to introduce our next speaker. <clears throat> I hope you're already here, Edwin. Good. Oh, okay, you're here. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Edwin Ogar is our next speaker. He is Vice um, Administrator of Terrestrial Environment and Resources, Water Resources in Nigeria, and he's Program Coordinator there. And he will give us a presentation on uh, uh, indigenous knowledge of Nigeria's Ikuri community in conservation of biodiversity and tackling climate change crisis. And I would like to introduce Edwin a little bit. Um, Chief Edwin Ogre is a Nigerian and his works uh, is, uh, are focused on conservation, sustainable forest management, community development, poverty reduction, benefits sharing, indigenous and translational knowledge, climate change, adaptation, mitigation, conflict management, community and land use planning. There's quite a huge spectrum of activities. <laughs> uh, very, very cool. Um, Edwin Ogre is an indigenous uh, of Ikuri community in the Cross River State in southeast of Nigeria uh, on the border to the Republic of Cameroon. It's a very nice area. I've been there several times already. And he's uh, owner of the Ikuri Community Forest, the largest community managed forest in Nigeria, and has developed indigenous and modern knowledge and contributed substantially to conservation and sustainable management of this forest in terms of benefit sharing and inclusive community activities, governance, and so forth. Um, he has spent over 19 years working in that Ikuri initiative on these issues, 
has published lots of articles on this and activities uh, even in, uh, in international books um, to benefit from his innovative experiences. And currently, uh, uh, he drews the Nigerian National Guidelines on community-based forest, man forest management and uh, is reading mass communications on the Polytechnic uh, Institute in Calabar um, as an ardent conservationist and conservation person to really try to further and foster the development of this kind of thinking and as our pre previous presentation would um, potentially frame it as a narrative in order to um, engage in the um, shaping a social transformation. Edwin, the floor is yours. I'm very happy that you joined and accepted our invitation to this um, meeting. Um, Let's start. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Um, well, I'm doing this presentation uh, because of the activities that every initiative has been, every committee has been involved in the conservation of biodiversity and tackling climate changes. Well, every community is in Nigeria. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa with uh, a population of over 20 million people, 200 million people, and has 36 states, uh, including the Federal Capital Territory. One of the states of Nigeria is Cross River State. Cross River State is on the southeastern Nigeria, on the border with Cameroon. And the state has three geo, uh, geo ecosystem zones. Beginning from the Atlantic Ocean, you can see the mangrove. You can also see a tropical forest. The tropical forest, as well as uh, the semi savanna forest to 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 north, and. Acre community happens to belongs to an indigenous group called Nkokoli. Nkokoli is a small tribe made of only five communities in the whole of Nigeria, just small five villages. But God has blessed us that we own the largest community forest in Nigeria and the best managed forest in Nigeria. How do we start? Prior to 1982. Okay. Um, yeah. The Agri Community Forest play a crucial role. You can see from the map uh, where Greek community forest is. Uh, the community forest play a crucial role in conservation of biodiversity, providing livelihoods to the indigenous people of Ekuri and beyond. It also serves to regulate climate and water, as well as mitigating climate change through capturing and recycling of uh, carbon uh, CO2. The forest also helped to preserve the indigenous knowledge of the people, and that is why indigenous knowledge is still there in Ekuri that has also motivated and inspired other communities to come and learn from our perspective. And the forest has also helped us to prevent uh, erosion as well as nutrient recycling, which has helped us to produce food that is um, useful for our survival. Well, in Lake Korea, as well as in Nigeria, they are drivers of deforestation. The first one has to do with the evergreen population because Nigeria is two, over 200 million people. Uh, so the population impact negatively 
and the forest ecosystem. And then there is also the issue of poor governance as decision making is only taken by government as it relates to forests without due consultation or inputs from the community. So this environmental injustice has led to uh, loss of forests. Then there is also illegal log logging and illegal logging, whereby government grants concession officially and the forest is locked. And then there is others who go into the forest and log without any concession granted to them. And then there is also commercial agriculture, whereby uh, investors in agriculture uh, acquire mass lands to plant either oil palm, cocoa, or rubber. Infrastructural development like roads, schools, health center, factories have also helped to deplete the Nigerian forest, as well as you know the, the slash and burn agriculture where uh, lands are cleared and they are burnt. And whenever they are burnt, uh, it means that uh, it would take many years for such a land to regenerate. So it contributes to, you know, uh, deforestation. The 1990 Land Use Act is also one of the bin that is affecting uh, degradation and loss of forest in Nigeria. Because the Land Use Act allows if government uh, the management control of all land in Nigeria, either it is communally owned or, or otherwise. So as a result, if like for instance in Ekuri, that we have the largest community forest, government has made several attempts to uh, take away the land, uh, to appropriate the land <laughs> to for other economic or uh, other ventures. If not for uh, resistant, uh, then the forest would not have been there. So because the land act takes the ownership of all land to under, under government custody, some community feel that they are cheated. Instead, they will want to have immediate benefit by even allowing people to come and either establish farms or lock the forest so that uh, at any time that government interest is to take away the land, it means they have benefited from their own land. And uh, this land also denies us the tenural rights. For communities, we don't have rights to our land. The land, the, the right is not uh, in law. It's not, it's not, it's, it, there's no law stating that the land belongs, there's no law made to support the community owners, owner of this land which is also the basic reason why uh, the conservation of forests is not granted in Nigeria. And then we also talk about unsustainable forest management practices uh, that is happening that also contribute to uh, deforestation as well as uh, degradation. <laughs> Yeah, the Ekuri Community Forest consists of two villages, old and new Ekuri, with a population of 6,200 people. And as I said earlier, it belongs to an indigenous group called Ngukoli. The other three Ngukoli community that are in other local governments. <laughs> but Ekuri Community, it, consisting of Ola Nyekuri is in Akankwa local government. So we control 33,600 hectares of community forest land uh, that is uh, located in Cross River State, uh, sandwiched to the north by the Cross River Open Forest Reserve. To the south is, is the Cross River National Park, the Urban Hill Division. And to the north is by Ekuri, Aen, and 
Nokokori <laughs> Community Forest, and to the west by Ikwese uh, Community Forest. Prior to how a community has been involved in forest conservation. Prior to 1982, the community has been using indigenous knowledge in the conservation of our forests. And as of then, we have no route, no motorable route from the community down to Ekuri. So we commenced formal community forestry in 1982 and started the Ekuri Initiative in 1992. And the focus of a Ekuri Initiative, which is a community NGO, is on conservation, sustainable forest management, livelihood, rural facilities, and later added climate change and land rights. Yeah, yeah, we, every community has adopted some strategy which has helped to ensure that the forest is conserved. One is timber inventory, whereby a 50 hectare plot is inventoried and trees from 70 centimeter diameter are uh, enumerated for harvesting while leaving the undergates to grow for another harvesting cycle of 50 years. And this ensured that uh, in subsequent years, there's going to be another inventory uh, exercise. And that will also help to ensure that that inventory plug will be there for centuries. And then uh, we also conducted perimeter because we need to know the size of our forest before ever we'll be able to uh, conserve it. And uh, we use land use plan as, as a strategy to ensure that uh, uh, we, zone, uh, we do zoning of areas that we intend to conserve. We have the community expansion, the protected area, which is 50% of the entire 33,000, which is 16,800 uh, hectare of forest land that is totally protected. We have the sustainable timber management zone, the NTFPs, the eco tourism, agroforestry stream, and then the farming and the cash crop zone, as well as the stepping to stones. Uh, we also have a non-timber forest product by ensuring that the community people have them while leaving timber harvesting to a pre-initiative who harvest an income generated from timber is used for development of the community. Whereas individuals who harvest non-timber forest products use the proceed gain to save development. Uh, uh, that is the road we communally constructed with the forest, with the forest on the both side of the road. And then we have rules and regulation on timber, animal, and fish management as a strategy. And we do reconnaissance survey through eco guides, through uh, hunters, forest gatherers who monitor activities in the forest and ensure that if any uh, forest is found, if there is any anomaly found, it is reported to the community. We do also outreach community education in neighboring communities. We do regular boundary planning to ensure that uh, it prevents others from trespassing in Ekuri Forest. We develop Ekuri community bylaws as well as, you know, participatory governance. That uh, the decision making about the Ekuri community for it is by the General Assembly made of all members of the community. And this participatory governance ensure that 
uh, we are able to protect the decision that we have taken. And then prosecution of the defaulters is by the chiefs or a crew initiative. Uh, we report it to the relevant government institution, which being the Forestry Commission. We also uh, do protest in terms of if our rights are being uh, uh, our rights are not addressed. And then uh, currently we just registered Bakery ICC Indigenous Community Conserve Area with UNEP WCMC. Okay. Yeah, um, as you, you may not be aware, um, in 19, in 2016, the Cross River State Forestry Commission, first, I mean, government of Cross River State, gave, took all our lands for a super highway road project. And this is what it started before we were able to bundle ourselves together, came up and protested and uh, overcome that pressure. So you can imagine if this route has gone through, because in Nigeria, as soon as a route is opened into the forest, it also brings in farmers, loggers, and by now the forest could have been done. And this is uh, the protest that we did some years ago uh, against government, the Forestry Commission. Conclusion. conclusion. The conclusion. Um, we have noted that the proactive rule of the Kuru community to preserve her natural heritage has the genuine capacity to meet the need of present and future generation. And it's something that is worth of a emulation by other communities to save Mother Earth from total depletion of resources and accompanying negative consequence on human being. Thank you and thank you. Shemo in Equities, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Edwin, for your presentation. Um, okay. Very, very important. Um, I would suggest that we just immediately continue now with the next presenta presentation. And let's hope that we have maybe time for one or two questions at, at the end. Yes. Um, please stay also for potential questions um, after, after the last presentation, Edwin. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's now a pleasure to introduce for me the last presentation of, of this workshop here. Uh, the last presentation will be given by Gisela Wachina from the Dialogic um, uh, Company Germany. Uh, uh, her presentation um, is on the BioWawi citizen science monitoring biodiversity by use of crowdsourced sound data. Her professional focus is on risk perception, risk governance of natural hazards, um, participatory modeling, citizen science, stakeholder participation, mediation and facilitation of environmental conflicts and mediation training. So by having this last presentation by Gisela, you're somehow rounding up the two the many different aspects of social transformation and also interaction between uh, the academic and non-academic world and I'm very excited also to have this last presentation here in our workshop. The floor is your Gisela. <laughs> Thank you for accepting the invitation. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, I'm very happy to present you uh, not results, but more an outline of uh, a project part uh, of uh, BioVari. Um, that means a citizen science project. And um, to show the co-presenters, uh, I'm Gisela Wachinger from Dialogic, and together with me here is uh, Wiebke Hebermehl, and also our coordinator, 
um, Dr. Flavia Di Giacomo. The whole project is uh, coordinated by, by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and we are working together with Lisa Gill in the Biotopia um, uh, Naturkunde Museum in, in Munich. And um, to outline the first, uh, yeah, the idea where it's uh, where all is coming from, you can uh, see here the nice flyer um, we Hegemi created, and um, there is a um, common water frog. And this year it was really difficult for amphibia uh, because of the the warm temperatures, and especially difficult in the middle of um, Germany where this project Biowavi is located. We are looking to a certain area, um, the area of Bühl, and um, there we, we try within the um, FEDER initiative, this project is funded by, by the FEDER initiative, by the um, uh, Ministry of uh, Germany, and there we try for a certain re region to show what the water, um, uh, the, the water and energy companies related to biodiversity and how it can be improved um, the, um, uh, by the research on biodiversity. And um, yeah, you can see the, the water frog and um, the numbers are really dropping down at the moment. And this is not only difficult for, for scientists, but also maybe normal people, not scientists, don't notice that there are less water frogs. But what they uh, maybe should notice is that there is a different sound of the landscape. So um, this sound, this bark of the water frog is somehow missing in, in spring. And um, that leads me to the topic of um, what we try to address. Um, we want, with a citizen science pro uh, project, enable um, all people, so volunteers, but also uh, people working outside, farmers, forestry workers, and NGOs, um, just to, to monitor the biodiversity by soundscapes. And so the, the method is very simple. I will show you later. Um, they can, with their smartphones, just um, for one minute uh, record a soundscape. And the idea is that this soundscape is really related to uh, the landscape and also to the uh, protection status, maybe, of uh, habitats. Or um, it is related to the biodiversity of the habitat. And that's, that is um, more or less related to the protection status. And that means um, that by um, um, yeah, by recording soundscapes, um, people can also make the uh, authorities aware where something is maybe at risk or something is going on. And um, that comes also to the very yeah, large difficulty we addressed in several talks in this um, conference, that um, the authorities may be just overwhelmed but uh, by, by the things going on at the moment. And the monitoring of biodiversity is not uh, possible of, uh, in all parts of um, uh, the country or all parts of Europe at the same time. And also, it's even more difficult if you want to, to track uh, temple changes. And the uh, biodiversity is changing so fast that you cannot cope with this, with the current monitoring, monitoring programs. So um, this method can, could be a solution to this. And just to show you one landscape in Bühl, and maybe um, you can also hear the sound if I record in now. I don't know whether you, you could hear this. It works, yeah. Maybe some, somebody can, can tell me whether it's um, Okay, this was the sound 
um, or is the sound of a nightingale uh, we record it just by just with our smartphones in the region of Bühl and um, nightingales um, yeah are somehow specialized to certain areas where you have bushes and also open landscape um, paths uh, you can also hear them in uh, cities but it is um, yeah, a certain characteristic, this border between open and um, vertical structures. And uh, so as nightingales are more or less uh, singing in the in spring or early summer, um, bird sounds maybe um, are not so present in the summer, but then you have other sounds, for example, here, uh, so, uh, sounds of the grasshoppers uh, here, the nightingale grasshopper. Maybe you can see this video and also hear the sound. Don't hear the sound, but at least I don't hear the sound, I just see the video. Ah, okay, so sorry, then uh, <laughs> never mind. We tried it yesterday, but uh, sorry. Um, but here you can uh, see this grasshopper. Um, uh, yeah, grasshoppers are usually located in in meadows, and here this meadow, uh, as soon as it uh, has been cut down, uh, the sound of this uh, lens part of the landscape will suddenly change. So it's not only the sound is not only representing um, the uh, view coordinates, but also the status of uh, a certain la landscape, how it is managed at the moment. So, um, if we we come to our um, first outline, in Biowabi, we are co-designing with citizens a method for monitoring biodiversity, which is easy, reliable, and can make a difference in future habitat protection. This is our idea. And um, uh, that the sounds of landscape represent the biodiversity and the status of the habitat. This is already uh, found in the literature. And um, we also um, tested that it's really easy. Um, sound files can be recorded by all people and no special skills are necessary. Th this is uh, the difference to a lot of citizen science projects we have in um, uh, biodiversity morning, monitoring, where people have to know at least birds or butterflies, or uh, it becomes even more complicated if it uh, comes to to smaller groups or to um, uh, not only fauna but also flora, where really specialists are needed. But to record sound files, everybody can contribute there are no special skills necessary and that makes a huge def difference so we can raise awareness in everybody <laughs> who is walking outside or working outside um, in uh, recreation areas and uh, beautiful landscapes um, or also in farmland or also in cities and uh, villages and um, on the other, other hand, these sound files are reliable and um, they provide really um, data which can be used for biodiversity monitoring. Um, here's the example of the Dawn Chorus uh, project and um, we are very grateful to uh, Biotopia and Lisa Gill that we can use uh, this app for collecting the sound files. This was a project, um, um, yeah, it, it was born in the lockdown in Germany and everybody was asked just to uh, um, record on the balcony or the terrace at uh, the morning dawn um, the sound of the area around the house. And there, um, interesting results have been created because there was no traffic noise and no airplane noise at this time but the project has been prolonged and now there are al almost 21,000 or 22,000 almost um, records uh, 
all over Europe so with the concentration on Bavaria and uh, southern Germany. And they, they really cover a lot of areas and everybody can take part and just um, upload uh, their own uh, smartphone record um, to this um, map and then immediately see and hear uh, the, the own recorded sound, but all the others as well. And um, so the uh, method will be developed like this. We have this data collection, um, so one minute sound record, um, uploading to this Dawn Chorus project. And then we try, on the other hand, to use geodata and land use maps um, uh, to correlate these sounds via the geodata uh, with a special landscape and a special land use. Um, we will also use the um, biotope cartierung and biotope typen cartierung and um, other um, uh, German special biodiversity indices. And um, this is done by artificial intelligence because it has to be uh, improved um, over and over. And um, this correlation is um, supposed to be directly and not over the detour of recognizing the animals and then coming back and uh, um, yeah, looking which animal is in which landscape. So it's direct, directly the, the sound of a landscape. But for the verification, this is the, the, in the third step, um, we need, of course, experts who can tell which birds are singing in these soundscapes, which grasshoppers, which amphibia maybe, and um, whether they are really present in this area um, and in this landscape. And this will be, we will test in uh, the region of Bühl, in the project region of Yovadi. And then the idea at the end is, in the fourth step, that these one minute sound files if we have really many of them, um, can represent not only the type of landscape, so whether it's a city or um, a forest or what kind of forest um, or open land, but also the status of the landscape. Uh, especially interesting in the Biowabi project is the water um, content of the landscape. And <clears throat> we experienced this year that this year was really dry and uh, so the um, landscape and the habitats for different uh, animals really changed and uh, therefore there was a di direct influence of the water shortage on on the sound of the landscape i'm oh, sorry um so we plan that with artificial intelligence methods um, these collected sound files can be correlated to the biodiversity status of habitats. And these sound files can be verified and evaluated by experts using animal sound recognition to validate the method. Um, so there will be maps. For example, you can see here the, the red areas are the um, areas of um, cities and villages, the green areas of uh, forest and uh, the uh, yellow of open land uh, um, and these maps are existing all over Europe or all over the world so we can all these sounds directly um, correlate to the geo -co coordinates so what is our outlook for the future um, we hope that sound fights will help people to diagnose the biodiversity status of the habitat and report possible risks to authorities. And these no nature authorities can be supported by a reliable biodiversity monitoring carried out by all interested pipe, uh, people um, while uh, recreating in nature. Um, here you see again this um, picture which shows this. Of course, this is a longer process because um, uh, to, to change the um, yeah, uh, all the regulations, how authorities have to monitor um, uh, biodiversity 
and add to these regulations maybe a sound uh, monitoring is not done in uh, in a year or so but this is just an outline uh, outlook uh, for this possibility um, so what have, do we have to do next um, we develop the uh, artificial intelligence power technology and therefore we are really looking forward to this call biodiversity and artificial intelligence where we could maybe um, ask for funding for this project then the second uh, step we are already doing is uh, to empower everybody uh, to contribute so uh, to do um, citizen science workshops and uh, um, go to schools and um, develop pro projects with them and then of course to implement this me uh, monitoring method in uh, nature protection authorities thank you very much here are the key messages um, and uh, i think with traditional methods habitat monitoring is stuck at the moment it's too slow and too scattered uh, so sound files seem to be a new and better representation of biodiversity, better in terms of um, ab more abundant um, uh, related to land use. The combination of citizen science, so um, the global participation of persons with local knowledge, not with expert knowledge, and uh, the artificial intelligence based big data processing has the potential to unleash habitat monitoring and bring it to a new level, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And a crowdsourced monitoring for biodiversity could be the solution for authorities, politics, education, and to raise environmental awareness. Thank you very much. Um, and please record sounds. We will have winter, but already in February, when this picture was taken in the Isar Valley, uh, you will uh, again hear the, the sound of landscapes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gisela. Um, we have time for one last question. I'm picking up one of the questions I see in the chat, uh, uh, which is coming from Markus Cisenis. How do you analyze the citizen science data, secure a standardized service by people and conclude met populations, for example, with quantitative data and so forth? So I, I have to pick pick up the, the question again. Sorry, I, because I... Sorry. Sorry. Uh -huh. uh, so the question was, how do, do you analyze the citizen science data, secure the standardized service by people and conclude uh, among meta populations and, for example, biodiversity quantitative parameters? Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe we have to go in, in, into more uh, detail at the, at the moment is um, until this artificial intelligence method is really um, created. Um, we, of course, have to analyze it by experts. And uh, for example, to tomorrow there will be a, a workshop where um, bird experts are uh, uh, training and, and um, yeah, are trying to analyze uh, a sample of these uh, sound data and to validate whether they all of them hear the same in the sound, sound data and whether that can be um, um, yeah, proven as a, as a good basis for um, biodiversity monitoring. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a small tiny problem right now. We were, we are running out of time. Um, we would have had a panel discussion now starting already quite some time ago, but um, I think all of the presentations were so extremely fascinating that I think it was worthwhile to go through all of the presentations and answer also a couple of questions directly.